Well, somebody said, this is the day the Lord has made and we shall rejoice. Somebody say rejoice and be glad in it. I'm just happy to be alive. How about you? Let me say again how honored I am to be here. Thank you to the blessed members of Witherspoon who are here. Again to my sister and colleague in the gospel, Reverend Maureen Wilson, the designated associate pastor here who is doing a phenomenal job leading this congregation and serving this community. Then again to my friend Reverend Hall who reminded me we served together on one commission or another. You know you Presbyterians. <laughs> and then to Craig Shaw, so good to see you friend. And to Dr. Webb for a phenomenal job he does leading the music ministry here at Irvington. <laughs> And to DJ Smith, your organist, which I have some sensitivity to because Myron Williams, our organist, oftentimes hides behind the music and never gets proper due. Let's give Brother Webb a hand. <laughs> Brother Smith, my apologies. And to you, the blessed people of Irvington, again, I repeat myself, I can think of no better way to start the Advent season then here with each of you. Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> Beloved, join me for a word of prayer. These words taken from the great African-American mystic theologian, Dr. Howard Thurman. Lord, open unto me light for my darkness. Open unto me courage for my fear. Open unto me hope for my despair. Open unto me peace for my turmoil. Open unto me joy for my sorrow. Open unto us all, O Lord, strength for our weakness, wisdom for our confusion, forgiveness for our sins. Give us love, O God, for our hates. Open unto us all thyself for ourselves. Lord, Lord, open unto me. Now, blessed Savior, let the words of my mouth and the sweet meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Speak to us, O Lord, for we are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the church say amen. amen. Again, let us commend these combined choirs for a wonderful job they have done. <laughs> to the musicians of Witherspoon and to our director of uh, music, Brother Mark Durrison on piano, Reverend Billy Myers on bass, Lamar on drums. Now, Dr. Webb, I make no, uh, don't mean to start any trouble with this statement, but to the best choral director this side of heaven, Dr. Gillian Harrison. <laughs> Turn to somebody and say housekeeping. As is my custom, I have changed my sermon title. <laughs> and there is one word on this, the first Sunday of Advent. I, 
I want to focus our heart's attention on. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. Yet. Yet. Turn to someone else with more power than that and say, neighbor. Neighbor. I'm as lost as you are. are. Yet. Yet. Say it loudly. Yet. Yet. Yeah, I like that. (laughs) Yet the hope of Advent. And uh, I will use as my supporting theme what is printed in the bulletin, I know where to find it. Beloved, one of the most beautiful and dynamic and brilliant pieces of literature ever penned in the English language is the iconic cultural masterpiece of Lift Every Voice and Sing. First written as a poem by James Weldon Johnson in the year 1900, and then later set to music by his brother John some years later. Known as the Black National Anthem, it is a dramatic and glorious tale of both the struggles and the triumphs of a people. Its skillfully crafted words conjure within the head and heart of the listener a mix of emotions. Throughout and within its lyrics, Johnson is able to achieve through words what many of the world's greatest visual artists convey on canvas. Persons like Renoir and the Two Sisters, Matisse and the Red Studio, Modigliani and his great masterpiece entitled Alice, Clementine Hunter and the Funeral Possession, Alma Thomas and the Eclipse, and the great Let My People Go by Aaron Douglas. Each stanza encapsulates within it the full spectrum of visual representations, emotional invitations, and historical reminders. Many of us are familiar with the first stanza, lift every voice and sing, till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty, Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song, Johnson says, full of the hope that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. And then we are familiar with the last of the three stanzas, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in thy path, we pray, lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee, lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee, Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand true to our God and true to our native land. But like many things, beloved, I would argue, we skip the most important part. For it is in verse 2, the least known of the three, that Johnson captures for us in vivid detail the moral and spiritual condition of his world and of ours. In verse 3, Johnson says, Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. What unusual phrasing Johnson uses here. Hope unborn had died. Who has ever heard of such a thing? As Africa's children The journey that our forefathers and foremothers had to travel 
The injustices that they had to endure, the inhumane acts that were shown to them were so tough, so debilitating, so cruel. This road was so difficult that in the words of Johnson, even hope that was unborn died. Johnson was no uneducated person. He was quite astute, both well-read and well-versed. Johnson knew of the 300 years of enslavement. He knew of the history captured and brought to a land that was not our own, denied the bare necessities of human dignity, treated less than even the lowest members of the animal kingdom. Yes, this was the road. Separated from our families, women abused and molested, men dehumanized and treated like dogs. This was the road. Motherless children, wives with no husbands and husbands with no wives, stripped of everything and seemingly left with nothing. This was the road. Darkness and stillness, gloom and despair, difficulty and obstructions, tears and sorrows, gray noondays and dark midnight hours. This was the road, torturous and dark, bleak and lonely, desolate and uncomfortable, unbearable. And while this poem was originally written to commemorate the birthday of Abraham Lincoln, Johnson wanted everyone to remember the conditions under which many have traveled. Stony the road we trod. Bitter was the chastening rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died. And though the conditions of our lives could never compare to those of the slaves, we here today, beloved, are living through an age where seemingly hope unborn has already died. When I look upon the faces of our children, I am ashamed to say I oftentimes see hope unborn had died. When I listen to the sickening political narratives broadcasted daily on our newsways, I am ashamed to say I often think to myself that hope unborn had died. When I think about poverty and police brutality, racism and homophobia, religious bigotry and economic inequality, I am ashamed to say that in my mind I, I often say of this age that seemingly hope unborn had died. All over the globe, people on every continent and of every walk of life are in search for a light of hope and a break from the madness of our times. All throughout the world, on every continent and in every city, people of every creed and of every confirmation of faith, people of every culture and of every nationality, millions of people battle with and suffer from the effects of educational disparity and racial inequality, economic insecurity and the lack of political diplomacy, Worldly insobriety with no regard for human dignity, ethical deformity with no reverence for cosmic divinity, the absence of morality and the prevailing deviation from authenticity, the lack of individual sanctity and the overabundance of vulgarity, communal animosity coupled with religious conformity, stony the road we trod, Johnson says, bitter was the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Johnson's words are cutting and eerily true for us here today. But even in more personal ways than this, I would suspect, Maureen, that there is someone here today on this first Sunday of Advent who knows something about hope unborn had died. I suspect that there is someone here today that knows something about traveling a stony road. There may be someone here today that knows something about gray noonday skies and dark midnight hours. Somebody here knows something about gloom and despair, difficulty and obstruction, tears and sorrow. And if we were to be honest today, we all know something about that which Johnson speaks of. Someone here may be standing at the Red Sea of life like Moses, walking through the valley of the shadow of death like David, sleeping in lion's dens like Daniel, too afraid to speak like Esther, facing death itself like Hezekiah, or drowning like Peter, or feel utterly hopeless and tired like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
I would suspect today that there may be someone here on this first Sunday of Advent who knows something about hope unborn had died. For in some way, beloved, we are all waiting. Waiting on a prayer to be answered. Waiting on our burdens to be lifted. Waiting for a miracle to be given. Waiting for a door to be opened. Waiting for a sign, any sign that God has not forgotten us. Advent, beloved, is a season marked by waiting. The spirit of anticipation in Advent is symbolic of the 700 years, yes, 700, that Israel waited for the Messiah between the prophet Malachi and the birth of our Lord. For 700 years they waited and longed for the prophecy to be fulfilled. And I will suspect, like many of us here today, that their hope began to wane. Waiting on God is easier said than done, beloved. Waiting on God is not only difficult, it sometimes feels impossible because we want things to happen in our own timing, according to our own plans, but God does not operate on our own schedules and expecting that he will only sets us up for disappointment. Waiting on God means sometimes going without answers to our prayers and wondering why the wicked seem to prosper and having the desires of our hearts delayed and our hopes deferred. The season of Advent is full of people waiting. Elizabeth is waiting for a baby. Zechariah is waiting to speak. Simeon is waiting to see the salvation of Israel. Anna is waiting on God's promises. Israel is waiting on God's promised prophet to come. Mary is betrothed and waiting to get married. But even more, beloved, the Bible itself is a tale of waiting. Abraham waited for the promise to be fulfilled. Joseph waited in prison for a purpose. Moses, Caleb, and Joshua waited in the wilderness in hopes for God's promise, Job waited through suffering. David waited to be king at the appointed time. Daniel waited for a breakthrough in prayer. And even Jesus waited for his ministry to begin. Waiting is a part of our spiritual heritage. And waiting, my feathered friends, is a part of life. But might I suggest today that waiting is not the problem. It is how we wait that makes the difference. Biblical waiting is not a passive activity, but it is demonstrated by active dependence and obedience to God. Waiting makes us stronger, for Isaiah says in Isaiah the 40th chapter, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not get weary. Waiting upon God is the antidote to stress. For as we wait and reflect, we give him our full and thoughtful attention. We are able to hear his voice when we wait patiently and quietly on God, waiting on God puts our spiritual desires before our worldly desires. It replaces worry and anxiety with a delight and happiness in God's direction, God's love, and God's care. Yes, it is how we wait that makes the difference. We too are invited to this Advent season to wait, to wait patiently, to wait fervently, to wait expectantly, to wait faithfully, to wait prayerfully. Though our hope may wane, it ought not ever be defeated. Though Abraham waited 25 years for his promised son, though Jacob waited and worked 14 years to marry Rachel, I'm glad Jillian did not make me wait that long, you see, and and though Joseph waited 22 years to be reconciled with his family, and though Jesus waited 30 years to begin his ministry, 
each in due time receive that which God had promised. And in our seasons of waiting, we must remember that God is always at work, beloved. We may not see what he is up to, but our God is too wise to make a mistake and too powerful to ever fail. If by chance today you are searching, if by chance you are longing for some answer, if by chance you find yourself tired and depleted on this, the first Sunday of Advent, if by chance you are empty and filled with despair, if by chance like humanity and our world you are desperately in need of hope and restoration today, I've come to tell you that all is not lost. Let me make my point more clear by beginning Starting now where I first began, lift every voice and sing. Till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicings rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till the victory is one stanza three once more god of our weary years god of our silent tears thou who has brought us thus far on the way thou who has by thy might led us into the light keep us forever in thy path we pray lest our feet stray from the places of god where we met thee lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee shadow beneath thy hand may we forever stand true to our god true to our native land but I dare say there is good news found in this unfamiliar second verse. There's a word here in verse 2 that ought to be the good news for every believer here today. For Johnson says, stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet, yet, yet. With a steady beat. That's it. There, there it is. There's the hope of Advent. Yet. Though tears will oftentimes fill our eyes. Though burdens will weigh us down. Though disappointments will break our hearts. Yet. Though stress will affect our nerves. Though opposition will test our faith. Though sorrow will seek to steal our joy. Yet. Though thorns will line our paths. Though clouds will hide the sun. Though circumstances will obstruct our goals. Yet, though sickness will afflict our bodies, the valleys will seem lonely, the climb will seem steep, the work will be worrisome, and our way will sometimes be narrow. There is a yet, and our yet is the hope of Advent. Johnson says here that yet with a steady beat, we must press on, beloved. This is the antidote that God has given us to the despair of this age. This is God's answer to our prayers in this world torn asunder. This is God's word for us who believe on this the first Sunday of Advent yet with a steady beat. We must remember the poetic words of Edgar Guest. When things go wrong as they sometimes will. When the road you are trudging seems all appeal. When funds are low and debts are high. When you want to smile but you have to sigh. When care is pressing you down one bit, rest if we must, but do not quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, as everyone sometimes learns. And many a failure turns about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up when the pace seems slow, you might succeed with another blow. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup. And he learned too late when the night slipped down how close he was to the golden crown. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. You may be near, you may be far. So stick to the fight when you are hardest hit. Rest if we must, but we must not quit. Johnson says here, yet with a steady beat. This is what biblical hope is all about. Biblical hope is not a guess. Biblical hope is not a maybe. 
Biblical hope is a sure foundation upon which we base our lives believing that God will keep his promises. And I've come by to tell someone today, whatever you may be carrying, whatever load may be heavy upon your brow, God will keep his promises. Yes, Israel waited 700 years for the Messiah. And Matthew reminds us today that humanity waited for 42 generations for Jesus to travel to the world. But in the end, God did just what he promised to do. So I say to you again, if by chance you are searching today, if by chance you are longing today, if by chance you find yourself tired and depleted, empty and filled with despair, if by chance, like humanity, you desperately are in need of hope and restoration today, I've come by to tell you that all is not lost. For I know where to find it. Oh yes, I know where to find it. There in the manger, there's a gift to be found. Yes, I, I know where to find hope there. There in the manger, there is joy anchored there. There in the manger, there is strength for the weak and laughter for the wailing light for those who walk in darkness. There in the manger, there is peace for those who may be in a storm. There are love for those who are lonely. I know where to find it for in the manger, we find Jesus, the Christ child. For Isaiah tells us, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And this is our hope today. This is the good news, beloved. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. He is given to all who search today. He is given to all who ask today. He is given to all who long today. He is given to all in need today. He is given to all who weep today. He is given to all who want today. I know where to find it. There is still hope for the world. There is still hope even for the church. There is hope for our communities. There is hope for our political systems. There is hope for our nation. There is hope for each and every one of you in the manger of Jesus the Christ. We mustn't give up, beloved. We must hold on to our yet. You may have to get up. You may have to look up. You may have to wake up. You may have to sit up. You may have to speak up. You may even have to perk up. But whatever we do, we must not give up. This is our hope when times are rough. Yet is our hope when our vision is farther along. Hope reminds us that somewhere over the mountainside, there is something better. There is something brighter. Just on the other side of our pain and suffering. One author once wrote these words, hope is the bright shining light that keeps darkness at bay. Hope is the gentle cool breeze on a hot summer day. Hope is to remain positive when going gets tough. Hope is standing strong when you've really had enough. Hope believes in tomorrow. Hope simmers like a diamond under sorrow. Hope sparkles when tears are in your eyes. Hope is a beautiful thing and beautiful things never die. We need not wait to celebrate today, beloved. We need not long as those who do not know how this story will end. We can rejoice now because the devil is already defeated. Satan has already lost. Darkness will not prevail. Difficulty will not overcome for we are the sons and the daughters of God. Yet with a steady beat, we must march on. Now I echo the words of Charles Albert Tidley. Harder yet may be the fight. Right may often yield to might. 
Wickedness may a wild reign, Satan's cause may seem to gain, but there's a God that rules above with a hand of power and a heart of love. And if I'm right, he'll fight our battles. We shall have peace someday. Yes, I know where to find it. It is in you. I know where to find it. It is in me. I know where to find it. It is in us. It is in this place. And so as I leave you now, hold on to your yet. Be not dismayed. Whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Oh, beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. We, we have hope, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory, divine heirs of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit and washed in his blood. Yes, we have hope through many dangers, toils, and snares. I have already come to us grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. Yes, we do have hope. What a friend we have in Jesus, all of our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Yet, yet, yet.